Hello, it's Wednesday morning, and it's time for relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. Um, and as uh, we have over the last, oh, quite a while, last month or so, we've had a Submarine Wednesday. And so, uh, once again, it's Submarine Wednesday. So it's time to find out what went wrong, or what will go wrong, because uh, this seems to be a challenge. So, I did a bunch of prep work yesterday, like I brought all the pieces that I've been working on over. That was an unveiling, wasn't that dramatic? Right? Um, the, uh, the forward torpedo room, actually the only torpedo room, um, I think I've got the torpedo racks done. It took a fair amount of manipulation and sanding and filing but they are now in place and they're pretty straight and that is that they're they are they are horizontal at least and they're in pretty pretty well what i needed to do was basically file off all the little prongs here the little extensions that fit into the holes that lined it up so that these verticals made contact with the bulkhead um, and then uh, I was able to cement the verticals to the bulkhead and give it a little bit of a little bit of support um, in doing so I noticed some places that needed touch-up paint some of the tips of the torpedo tubes uh, torpedoes and actually tiny little spots right at the junction of the red and the silver so I'm going to do that this morning do some touching up there on the back side uh, if you recall this actually gives rise to three decks this is the head or the bathroom those are toilets and I need to give this yet another coat of ivory paint it as I look at it it just it's not um, it's not even uh, so I'm going to do that. So I'll do that as painting as well. And then I'll let this set aside. And then later in the show, in the stream, I guess it's a show in the stream, I'll be installing this into the hull of the submarine. It goes there. Just like that. Except it's supposed to fit. And it doesn't, of course. So we'll just we'll play around with the fit and the finish until it, it settles in there. Uh, basically, the curvature of the hull is a little less. The radius is less than there. It'll go in like that. Okay. And then this, with all of the detail of the dials and the torpedo hatches and junction boxes and things, and eventually ends up going in front of it like that. Okay. And right here, oh, yeah, and it's supposed to not stick, but it did. And then this little thing here, this is an escape hatch. I don't know how you're supposed to get to it, you know, because it's just kind of hanging out there. Maybe you have to wait for the compartment to fill with water. I don't know. That would be, that would be kind of weird. But anyway, that gets glued in too. So I'll be doing that, and hopefully that will be like the accomplishment du jour of finally getting the torpedo room um, inserted into the hull after I do the touching up. A little bit of red, a little bit of green, a little bit of this where there's the cement is showing, so there's a shiny spot. I don't know what I'll do with that. It's kind of kind of tiny. Um, but I need to do the ivory and the red for sure, and then I'll, I'll look at it more closely. Um, the other thing I'll be doing today is, this, and this is a planned thing, is if you recall, there was a gap here between the top of the sail or conning tower and the rest of it, and I filled that in with a plastic putty that's been sitting there for a week and hopefully is now very solid, and I'm going to sand that down so that it's one nice, smooth, continuous surface. And if the plastic putty works, that will happen. I'll be using a slightly coarse sandpaper to contour it, and then 
a really, really fine one to sort of polish it. The other thing I'll be doing is unexpected because there's always something, right? Remember when I was painting the cutaway, the hull color and, and the, the dark gray, and it was, oh, that looks really nice now. And I very, very carefully kept it off of the surfaces. Well, for some reason, somehow, um, the paint oozed around the bottom and now it's a mess underneath. And in some places a lot. I mean, there's a lot of paint there. And I'm not sure quite how that happened. I was, you know, not putting very much on it. I'm beginning to think I might have thinned the paint a little bit too much. Anyway, I need to get the green and the cork brown out and even out that edge on the bottom without getting it onto the visible edge on the front. And that will be the painting things I'll be doing today. Because you have to have some painting with relaxing painting. Most of what I'll be doing today is starting to work on number three, the mess deck and the bunk deck. And as you can see, from the instructions, uh, there are lots of tiny, tiny little pot parts, including if you can, I put them in this plastic bag so I wouldn't get lost. Um, this is a bag of bitty, bitty little chairs. And they're very badly molded. In fact, so badly molded, I might go to my donor submarine kit and see if the ones there are any better. Um, I did, in fact, actually have to borrow a couple of pieces from the donor submarine because the ones from the kit I'm working on were so badly warped. This was, this is even, you know, plus straight. The other one was badly curved, as was this piece here. Um, you can see they're a slightly different, darker color, which, of course, will not matter once they're primed and painted. Um... So there's two sections here. There's the mess hall, which includes wonderful detail like coffee urns and hanging meat and uh, shelves full of uh, spices and canisters on the sink and hanging pots and pans, which will be a lot of fun to paint at some point. Um, and then there's the bunk deck, which is just this flat deck with four uh, four sets of bunks, each of which has eight bunks on it, and then the bulkhead on either side. And as is, this is the thing I'll probably be working on because if it, if I can get these pieces cleaned up today, um, then I can prime them and to begin painting them. I'll be painting the floor and then the bunks. The bunks will be painted much like the bunks here with kind of this brown frame and white sheets, okay? But, um, I'll give you some examples here. This is a before and after of a bunk. And if you can see it, you can see that there is a horrible mold mark on there. And if you look fairly closely, you can even see that the two halves uh, no, it's probably not very much. It's maybe like a 64th of an inch, a fraction of a millimeter. One side is higher than the other. In fact, this side, the top, looking at it here, is larger than the other side. Um, and what happens is when they... This is the floor. Yes. I guess... Well, you know, you make do with what you've got, and I might even have to use three subs. That would be really good. So anyway, what happens here is when it when these mold marks are on and the unevenness, and you put them into the floor, um, there's this huge gap here, and in fact, it rocks back and forth because the middle is higher than the sides. And after a fair amount of uh, filing, one can get it to, um, you know, be okay. Even this one is just still raised up a little bit. I'm not quite sure why. 
think should be right on the floor. There's a little bit of a gap there. I guess that's okay. The uh, but it's laying. It doesn't. It doesn't rock too much back and forth. So I need to make these other three more like this. The bulkheads are not too bad. They have these flashings on them that comes off pretty easily. But the bad thing about them is they have these circles as part of the molding process. And those are not a natural part of the submarine. So this whole thing needs to be sanded down. This one's even worse. It's got four of them. It needs to be sanded down so those don't show. And uh, then... It goes together like that. You get some fire extinguishers in there. I guess that's a good idea to have those in your bunk room. And then this blank one goes on the other side. That and the bunks go in. And then there's a staircase that goes up from the bunk room. This tiny little staircase that is almost unrecognizable because of all the flashing and stuff on it. Um goes up from there directly into the middle of the uh, goes up here through that through that hole there up into the upper bunk room and next to the galley so we're beginning to see how this sort of comes together uh, depending on how much time there is you know and how the cleaning up of these parts goes um, I might go back to this. I don't need to get this done right away. This can actually go into the submarine very later. Uh, but I'm going to continue working on trying to get the dials to show. I had some success by putting um, felt tip pen on the smoothed down head of a nail and stamping it. And I'll I'll keep trying that, and then I will uh, get the green paint out because it's supposed to be painted the same color as the green interior here, and start painting around all these little detail bits, trying not to get paint onto the dials that I successfully highlighted. Yeah, that'll be this will be a challenge. This this could take forever and be quite frustrating as. I try to get the paint onto the bulkhead without getting it onto these little protuberances. But, um, yeah, so much for talk talking. I need to do a flip for uh, who, especially. So I'm going to set, yeah, this is really good. I'm going to set this aside without having it fall, because if it falls, then the torpedo room will break into many pieces and be awful. Let me flip this used piece of paper towel. You can see the different sides. This has three green dots on it. And this one has a purple splotch. So you can tell which way it lands. Here we go. Anyway, there we are. Um, I think what I'll start with, since I just want it now, I want the paint to dry on the forward torpedo room. Okay, it's important that that dry, uh, so that I can, at some point during the stream today, um, install it into the hull of the submarine. That would finally. You know, maybe look like it's accomplishing something. So what I wanted to do was I'm going to give this a second, a third coat actually, and I need to do a little bit of red touch-up on the torpedo heads. And I will take my glasses off and see what I'm dealing with. You know, that's really weird. Um, the camera's working here, but there's a ring light on it. 
There it is. I was wondering why everything was so dark. The ring light hadn't lit up. Just checking to see if I want to mess around with any green or bone light touch-ups. And I'm thinking not. It's just the red touch-ups that I need to do. Um, yeah. So, let's do that. I'm going to do the torpedo head. Tiny little, tiny little spots of touch-up. I probably really should take the Vortex Mixer off of the workbench, but then then we wouldn't have all of these wonderful, you know, special effects like that. They're probably some of the best parts of the stream. Um, so yeah, I'm going to... the. There are two different kinds of spots here on the um, torpedo heads that need touching up. There are some spots where the paint just got kind of worn off up here, which are very easy to do because they're not in contact with anything else. And then there's some others that I noticed as I was putting these racks on that um, where the red paint just didn't quite go far enough and then there's all this tiny little bit of um, silver spots that are showing where they should. So I'm going to try to do those first. And if you're looking at this from any sort of distance at all, you can't see those spots. Just putting the rack together, they showed up, and I didn't like them. So, um, yeah, I titled this show More Cost Overruns because of, so far it's not this. This is, this is actually not, not gone bad yet. I say yet because things just always seem to, uh, Anyway, there's always something, right? Just that this has always been something. So getting this into the hull is going to be a huge deal. I mean, a really big deal because I've been kind of working on this now for a week of Wednesdays. Okay, well, that's good enough. Yeah, wasn't that good? I really, I got that going there. I, I learned a little bit about how to manipulate the, uh, the, the mixer so that it either does or doesn't. As you call it, create a rave effect. Yeah, so there's that. Um, now, I'm going to put the ivory... Come. This is like a seven coffee cup day. Oh, our cat came down to say hi. And this keeps rotating. There we go. I don't know. I've got really grubby pants on. Um, you might see them a little later as I file things. 
but when I started filing this this thing um, last Wednesday, uh, it it generates a lot of really fine polystyrene um, dust, really fine plastic dust. And I didn't want to get it on pants that were anyway. Yeah, these are already dirty, so that won't matter. Okay, now I need to um, give the ivory paint a good stirring. I'm going to be using the large brush on a very small area because I don't want too many brush marks, so I'll just be doing that. That's my intent anyway. We'll see if I can make it happen. Just, uh, you know, from the, you can just see the unevenness even from the side, so it's going to show pretty badly. So we'll just uh, keep slapping paint on it until it looks okay. So having discovered that this ivory paint, which looks really fine on a minifig when you're doing tiny little dots of spot and spots, does not cover very well on larger surfaces. Fortunately, the head or the restroom is the only place on the submarine, the only cabin or area of the submarine that's painted this color. So I'll only be using it on the part of the hull that's related to the restroom. Let me show that to you. It's just a small area here, right there. I'll be using it there. And on the um, opposing bulkhead, the, the other side of the restroom which I think is you know is supposed to have like sinks and mirrors on it but that doesn't come up until part four of the instructions The intent here is to um, put a nice even coat of paint of this ivory color. It's here. a color difference between the painted and unpainted areas but that should disappear as the paint dries okay that looks like that actually should actually should cover there um, so I'm gonna let this sit like this I guess let it dry I'm gonna clean this brush and then I'm going to get the cork brown and the green paints out and fix the bottoms of the the floors on the conning tower or sail where the gray paint managed to spread all over the place. I'm going to have to, you know, like this, and the edge of this needs to be painted that same dark gray, but I'm going to have to figure out what's wrong with the paint before I do that, because um, I don't want the same thing to happen there. I get a nice clean line on one spot, and then turn it over and see that it started it decided to flow all over the place okay now it looks pretty straightforward but there's a 
there's two complications. One is whether or not the gray paint looks fairly smooth or not. I think I'm going to very, give it a very light sanding just so that it doesn't show um, an unevenness. And then the um, I need to be kind of more cautious with this than you might think because these pieces, if you remember, they're not cemented in. Okay, they, they will come out. And I decided not to cement them in because that would just be hard to do. They're, they're staying in place right now. And that's, that's about what I can help with. Yeah, I'm going to have to move this back here. What I'm doing is sanding down some of the... Trying to at least some of the gray paint that oozed over the edge. It doesn't, it doesn't show too much of a... Tribulence. really disappointing because I got this surf you know this line is pretty good it's not bad it's a little wiggly but not bad but then the paint just oozed over the edge I need to fix that because if you're looking at this you know if you're looking at this and it's down here you're looking at it kind of from the top there's no problem but if you got down underneath and you might for some reason I don't know why but a reason you would see that it's not good. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to use slightly larger, pointier brush than the tiny brush that I use for the red touch up. Because I need to get um, covering kind of a large area. So I'm going to try to get the brush. You know, just really horizontal and just touch this up along the edge without getting the paint down onto the gray again. Because, well, then the worst that can happen is the gray paint comes out and we see what happens. So I'm going to do the, the brown ones first. So what's good about this is that if I can get these done, without messing it up in the opposite direction, that is getting this brown or green paint onto the edging, then I can say I'm done. I'm done with the conning tower sale. And then I can spend, I'm gonna be spending almost the entire, yeah, that was pretty good. almost the entire stream today prepping parts for the mess and bunk decks. So this is going to be the painting part of the relaxing painting today. Um, The only other parts that might be painting-esque would be if I work a little bit more on the forward bulkhead. So this is 
This one's not perfect, but it's like a 90% okay. Maybe to this one. A lot of paint dribbled over the edge here. So this is this is part of the cost overrun for today. It's a result of a slight overrun from the last stream when I very confidently painted the cutaway edges of this section of the submarine. Being very, quite happy with the line that was formed across the top of these floors but then as i was doing prep for today i turned it over and saw a good deal of paint had run onto the bottom of these floors i think what had happened is this this is a dark gray color is that when I was painting these large areas, like here, and I wanted it to not show too many brush marks and stuff, I thinned it out. It's one way of accomplishing that. And in the process of thinning it out, made it a little too thin for this kind of application. I'm just going to do this is basically scrape it off the under the overlayer. Um, yeah, this is this is getting pretty close to being okay. Okay. Yeah, I can live with that. Certainly better than it was. Now I just need to do the green part. And after that, this this gets to be set aside so that that can dry. I don't want to keep sticking my fingers in it, for example. And then I'm going to work on the bunks and the staircase and the bulkheads. And if, if the minimum I want to get done today is the parts for the bunk room, and I can prime these and start painting. And this isn't going to be too challenging. Well, several challenges. One is the color of this floor. The, um, the cork brown that I've used here that particular paint works really well. It levels nicely. I can do it usually in one coat, sometimes two. Okay, but it's not its not the color that shows on the um, box top. If you look at the box top, this is a little darker than this, right? And so in the forward torpedo room, I used a lighter color which I'm not going to show you right now because um, I don't want to mess with that right now. And so I, this little bit right here is the lighter color and I experimented with that and it didn't cover all that well. Um, so what I'm going to do with this particular set of rooms, okay, the control room, the forward bunk room, the uh, bathroom, the mess hall, and this bunk room down here okay, is 
This piece here goes on the very, very bottom of the submarine. It goes way down here like this. Okay. Actually, right there, the two, the two semi bulkheads. Um, it's onto that, and then go in these slots here. Like that, at least theoretically, right? Like everything else, nothing really fits. Um, at any rate, this part down here doesn't show very much. And so I'm going to take the color that I used for the floor of the bunks and paint the bottom of this and after it's primed and see how it uh, levels. And if it looks okay, I mean, if it turns out to look good, then um, I'll use it for all the rest of the floors. If it doesn't, then I'm just going to sand it down. And I need to anyway, because it's got all sorts of little lumps and things on it. And use the cork brown that I used here for all the rest of the floors. Anyway, um, that's, that's the intent as I continue to try to figure out how to make this thing look good. Uh, green, I need to paint this bit along here. some green paint here too much yeah it's with the brown fix fix the uh, gray overrun It's a little wiggly, but not too bad. I want to not get it in the gray. There we go. And there was a spot, yeah, up here in the in the front. That also had the uh, overpaint issue. Okay. And if you look at it from the side and top now, it is. 
It's in that 90% range again, right? All right, ta-da. That's the relaxing painting du jour, is fixing the bottoms of those floors so that they're, if not perfect, adequate. Um, so I'm gonna let this all set. There'll be a little touch up of dark gray, but the gray paint will be coming out many times. Um, so I'm gonna let this set. What I'll be doing yet today then is installing the torpedo room up here. That'll be going in a little bit later. Once the ivory paint is fully dry, and I didn't get it on everything, that's good. Um, then after that sets, I'm gonna install the escape hatch. Move the camera slightly so you can see those parts. I might continue to work on the forward bulkhead detail. And also after all this paint has dried, I'm going to work on sanding down the very ragged junction line here between the top of the sail and the rest of the submarine. Okay. But there is, uh, there's a part done. And by the end of the day, if there aren't any other disasters, please, the, uh, there, this will be done except for the forward bulkhead as well. And the parts I'm working on now are the bunk room and the uh, mess deck. I think it goes... Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to piece it together. This eventually goes in here like this. Okay. And the bunks go down here. And then there's this, and then there's the control room on top of it that fills in this area. These go into tubes like that on the next deck down. They slide up and down nicely. Um, so yeah, basically it'll be, this goes in like this. The next deck, you can see the gap here. Next deck goes right there like that. Um, this detail stuff will need to be painted in after the hull. Most of this hull is... Most of it is painted light blue, which is the middle color here. That's, that's the relaxing blue color of the bunk rooms and the mess hall. goes in here between these two big bulkheads. Um, this is a bunk room here. I don't understand why all of these little control sorts of things are are there. But they are. And then under here is the gyro room, which has this canister with a gyro uh, like a flywheel basically that spins around these next two sections the the mess bunk hall and the control room are the two most challenging parts on the entire submarine you would think given the progress that we haven't made so far that what's been done has been the most challenging uh, but no, there's just tiny little pieces, lots of detail, unexplained um, control devices in the bunk room that will be painted something just, you know, so you can see them. Junction boxes with little dials on them, maybe. And then a whole lot of detail on the control panels up in the control room. But I can set this aside for now. Put it way over here. 
out of this, out of my way here. And uh, continue working on this. So what I'll be doing right now is going to be pretty boring stuff. I'll have to find something boring to talk about while I'm doing this pretty boring stuff, which is fixing all the parts that were poorly, poorly manufactured. I wonder... I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to check on this, okay? I'm going to get my donor submarine, and I'm going to take a look to see whether, whether all of these pieces like this might not have been better molded in that submarine than this one. I might just swap out, I mean, whole sections of it, just like this. This isn't really extremely well done. There's... If you can see it, see the unevenness there. That's a result of being the upside of uh, that. But I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that right now. I'll be back in just a minute, and we're going to take a look at the parts from the other submarine. I'm building is a George Washington and um, in case you weren't sure when you bought it it's fabulous okay it's with an exclamation point right there on the end of the box this was the first one that came out uh, the next one that came out was a redesigned one it was the Ethan Allen and it's just Ethan Allen it stopped being fabulous so between the George Washington and the Ethan Allen, fabulousness was lost. Somehow, I'm not sure how or why. You can see that um, there's lots of parts, right? These were the two parts that I swapped out because of the warp. Even on, even on screen, you can see this goes up in the control room later, that they were just really badly bent. So that, those got swapped. As did this piece, that's this one with the hatch on it. You can see the difference. You can see the difference in the quality of the molding, okay, between the Ethan Allen and the George Washington. And this one also was badly warped. I'm not, I didn't, I wasn't building the Ethan Allen because um, the original was the George Washington, and that's the one I wanted to work on. And it got started. This is this is somebody's attempt to do this. You can see the difference. Anyway, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna root through this box. Is, you know what great fun rooting through parts, right? To see if the parts are any better. Um, than the other ones. Here's one of the here's one of the bunks. And the answer is no, they're not any better. They're, I mean, look at them. The color is different, but the flaws, even, even the flaws in, in the molding are identical. Hmm. Well, it was worth looking. It was worth checking.
And there's lots of lots of pieces in here that you know might be useful later. Just for example, here's one of the kitchen parts. And if I were to find the one that was the equivalent, let's just waste some time doing this, right? Um, I will, in just a minute. Just a minute, give me time. I'm playing with, I'm playing with tiny submarine part. That I have very carefully put in this little box because they're little and they can get lost easily. It's the equivalent one. This one. Here, yeah, here it is. This is the same part as that part. And there really isn't too much to be gained by going from one to the other. There's a little bit more flashing like on the edges of the light colored one, which is the one that comes through, but there's this, the same, the same flaws. It's almost identical. So the only real gain I made by going with the, um, the Ethan Allen was replacing the parts that were warped. Okay. That were so bent that they couldn't be used, but it was, it was worth uh, checking, you know, to see the, uh, the parts, the only, the only other part that might be worth looking into would be those little chairs. And when I look at these little chairs here, all these little chairs, right? They, Actually, these little chairs are a lot better than the little chairs from the other model. Um, I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this as an option. It, they're so small you can hardly see. Okay, but the difference I see here is that there isn't a mold mark down the center of the chairs. And if, I'll take a chance and take some of these out here. It's bits and little pieces. Um, yeah, there really isn't much difference between the two. The, there's a little less flashing the really thin kind of plastic on these than they were on the ones that came with the George Washington. But I'm going to keep this in mind as a source of little bitty chairs that might be easier to make work than the other one. Okay. Um, well, while I am filing things, standing and filing, I won't really have to be paying attention very much to what I'm doing other than testing the fit now and then to see how it looks. So there's been a request that I talk about uh, old television. Let's see if I can, can remember some stuff. I know in the recent past, I've talked about old televisions, you know, that is to say televisions with picture tubes. This is why I'm wearing these grubby pants with all these stains and stain and things because I'm going to be filing and creating all sorts of little gray plastic particles that will be getting everywhere. So what I was talking about in the recent past was televisions with vacuum tubes and picture tubes and how um, how it was that the 
advent of what I'm going to do here. This is a very, very fine sand emery cloth that can be used to polish these ends so that um, there isn't too much contrast in texture once, once they're installed. And I don't need to do the bottom because that's not going to show. Um, yeah. So I wasn't so much talking about 70s television shows as much as I was talking about 70s televisions and all of the employment that came with them. You had television repair people who came to your house. You had house calls for your TVs, just as you did actually with doctors, physicians. Physicians made house calls then. And the reason for that was the house calls being made is that at least, you know, in the, in the late 40s and even right on up and through the early 50s into the mid 50s, it's that not everybody had a car and couldn't get around. Or there was one car. Okay, so you had a sick kid, right? And the dad was at work because it was always the dad then. Um, and the physicians just made rounds. They went from, you know, they they left the office and they went from house to house because they had a car and not all of their patients did and they, their patients couldn't all get to them. And the reason for television repair people going house to house was slightly, slightly different. Um, television sets then even the smaller ones were amazingly heavy because the, the picture tube itself, especially as they got somewhat larger, once they got past like 12 inches diagonal, which doesn't sound like much now, but was, you know, a medium sized TV at the time. Once they got past about that size, they they were really hard to move. So when you got a new TV, usually the place that sold it would actually deliver it and set it up for you. Usually, and there were there were always two people. They they really were beastly big, and once you put them down, they didn't. Uh, they didn't move and, and just, you know, digressing a little bit, you always have to kind of wander from one thing to the next as, as we talk about this. Um, the, there was, there were portable TVs, they were called. Um, they had small screens, like nine or 10 inches, and they came with a handle on the top and they were specifically designed to be portable because your, your standard TVs were definitely not portable. So one of the reasons there were the TV repair people came to you was that it was extremely difficult to get your TV to the repair shop. It took two people to move it. And, you know, and generally, all you need, you still had work to do. You had to pull it away from the wall because the TVs were almost always up against the wall, right? Like most furniture, you put them against the walls so that, uh, you know, you didn't, you could all watch it from the other side of the living room. But, yeah, you pulled it away from the wall took the back off, got out your uh, tube tester so you could see if, it, sometimes it was really straightforward, like there was a tube that didn't light up. They all glow this kind of 
Uh, interesting orange kind of color. The emitter glowed. Because tubes had emitters. That's how they worked. Um, the emitter glowed. And uh, if it didn't glow, then you knew that the tube was bad and you could... That was a simple fix. He pulled it out and replaced it with a new one. Hopefully, that's what worked. Sometimes, um, it was a little more complicated. They had circuit boards on them, but it's not the same as the circuit boards we think of today, you know, in integrated circuit. These, these were um, pieces of plasticine with tiny little holes punched in them, and on the backs was a myriad of metallic lines. And the way they worked is that you would insert individual components like resistors and capacitors into these little holes, and the little metallic lines or the connections among them. So each one was designed specifically for a purpose in the TV, but sometimes one of those components, most often like a capacitor, would go bad. And so the TV repair person would have to track down, I mean, trace down what little tiny component on the circuit board had gone bad so that they could, they would actually do that. They'd pull it out, stream short it out. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Is the stream not streaming? Mm -hmm. So who in chat said the stream shorted out and I'm not sure what they meant by that. Huh, it stopped and then restarted? Weird. Because I didn't do anything on this end other than, um, you know, well I know what happened. It just got bored. It got like, oh, what are you talking about now? This is really awful. I'm just going to just stop. I, as a, I don't know, you know, a semi-intelligent organism, stream deck, whatever, decided that hearing about coming house calls by TV repair people and how that relates to... Um, house calls by physicians or doesn't, how they comparing and contrasting the two, you know, how they were similar and how they were different. Probably was enough um, to just make the stream stop. Anyway, yes, uh, so yeah, they would come come to the house and the first thing they'd do is to make sure it was plugged in because sometimes that would happen, like a kid or a pet or something would bump into the cord and unplug it and then nothing's working on my TV. What do you mean nothing's working? Well, nothing, it doesn't come on, I don't get a little dot, I don't get a test pattern, none of the tubes start glowing. Did you plug it in? Yes, of course I plugged it in. Well, could you check? What do you mean, check? Of course I plugged it in. What do you think? I'm an idiot. You're calling me an idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. That the TV's plugged in. And then you check, and of course it's not plugged in. And then, you know, because it couldn't be your fault that it's not plugged in, you started screaming at the pets and at the kids and who unplugged the TV. And now I'm embarrassed because... Um, the TV wasn't plugged in and the repair person made me feel foolish. Uh, you know, you'd have this whole family drama that would start up because of your television not being plugged in. And that was probably just way more exciting than watching like uh, the Green Acres or something. Anyway, yeah, that's kind of the saga of uh, some... Uh, 1950s and 60s television. I 
think about Trump is as my uh, header for this said more cost overruns. Yeah, imagine this was just the real the real nuclear submarine, right? And your vendor delivered all of your bunks. Here's a whole set of bunks because they would do that, right? You just have a bunk subcon bunk subcontractor probably. And uh, yeah, they'd come and and you'd find that every single one of them needed rework. You can, you can begin to imagine how that went then. It's like they who does the rework? Do you send them back to the to the manufacturer and say these are defective bunks? You you know, get them get them fixed and of course that throws the whole assembly schedule off because you can't get your bunks put in because they all needed to be reworked. Schedules. I mean, the cascading effect of that kind of thing could be it's probably huge. This one, this one rocks pretty badly. The center is just higher than the edges, so give it some more some more filing here yeah begin just just think about how that would cascade so these bunks come in they can't be installed as it is there you get to the bunk assembly schedule and you know they come in maybe a week ahead of time but they have to be reworked and the guys the the vendor says well we can redo these or send you new ones or something but it'll take a month and a half so everything gets thrown off by three or four weeks, everything else down the line. Maybe you can reschedule some other things to be working on that at the same time. Maybe not. And so the, the arguments the, the arguments begin about who is responsible. And the responsibility isn't just the responsibility for you know the cost of the Fixing the bunks, you could probably pin that on the uh, the bunk manufacturer, right? Like these bunks don't work, take them back, send ones that do. Okay, it's gonna run, and the company goes out of business, and they all get laid off, and downside of that, and then you have to find a new bunk manufacturer. That would be a really bad situation, where your vendor just can't afford to do the rework that you need to have done uh, but anyway so the you know the rework gets done and then, uh, then the whole blame game moves into the and who's paying for this game but so the general dynamics here says well we're not paying extra for the rework bunk it wasn't our problem that the bunks didn't work in the first place you know, the bunk manufacturer needs to absorb the cost of that, but who absorbs the cost of all of the other delays and extra costs to those manufacturers and vendors? But the, eventually what happens is that uh, we end up paying for it. Yep, because there's a cost plus contract, right? Which basically says that you want this nuclear submarine and it, uh, this is what it costs us. And yeah, we have to pay three times over for these bunks. Twice for the bunks and then for all of the other vendors who lost money uh, because of the delays and things. So that's how you end up with uh, major cost overruns on your submarine. Because we're seeing it right here, the uh, the manufacturing defects in your bunks. Wanted to polish these ends. Anyway, back to televisions. Um, before, so that you could enjoy wonderful shows. Um, 
like the Milton, Milton Berle show and the Ed Sullivan show and the Red Skelton show and the Danny Kaye show. the Lawrence Welk show and later on the Carol Burnett show you know the Jackie Gleason show all of these people had their own shows and as I said before the variety shows the, there wasn't much variety in the variety shows in this in that each one of them was very formulaic you know, the host would come out and do kind of a monologue and that kind of thing, like almost like they do now. And then they'd have somebody singing and then somebody dancing and some musician. But yeah, Dean Martin, I mean, everybody had a show. Who else? Gary Moore. I mean, people you probably don't even remember or hear, have, hear of anymore. All had variety shows. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. So those kinds of things filled most many, many evenings. And then there were the Westerns. And let's see. Of course, all the Westerns were very stereotypic, too. They were based on, many of them were based on, or named after, not based on, really, but named after real people, like Wyatt Earp, and Daniel Boone. Yeah, why am I filing this side? Because of these little round marks that we've seen before on different things. They're little round spots like that that you can barely see. But when you paint it, they show up. They're real obvious. And it's like, you know, this bed frame didn't have a little round thing on it. So we file down around it and down to it so that they more or less disappear. I just think there were the westerns went on forever and ever. So I'm trying to, you know, you ended up with like Bonanza and stuff. But I'm trying to think of the ones that were never in color. You know, the pre color ones. Um, Mm -hmm. And of course they weren't, you know, they weren't real, like Wyatt Earp, who was really kind of a jerk, I think, in real life. He and his brothers, probably not a whole lot better than who were they, the Clantons, that they had this big gunfight at the o OK Corral that became a legend. But the theme song, you know, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. All of those things couldn't just be like brave, right? Hi, thank you. Thanks for joining in and, and becoming a follower. Um, yeah, especially on Cost Overrun Submarine Wednesday. Where I'm just fixing parts that were badly made. So that I can prime them and begin painting them next week on Submarine Wednesday. It's really unfortunate, and maybe I'll just do it the opposite way, is that when you're looking at it from the outside in, the bunks are supposed to be installed this way, you know? But this is also the side that has all of those little round flaws on them. And if I turned them around so that the bunks faced this way, you know, it doesn't look much matter. Um, I wouldn't be dealing with the same issue. 
So I'm going to be contrary when I install these things probably and I'll put the bunks in facing the, the same on both sides. Okay. Just make it would look better and make life easier if the bunks were facing this way. And there's no reason why not, why they shouldn't, you know, why, what difference does it make? Because there's just four, four sets of eight bunks, there's 32 bunks down here, way in the bottom of the submarine, like in the belly of the submarine. Thanks. Um, oh, so you like you do this too? You do carving and filing and sanding and th stuff. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. And uh, what we're what I'm working on here is this 1960s vintage submarine, which is well designed and badly executed. Okay, some parts of it are just beautifully designed with huge detail like pots and pans hanging from the hooks on in the galley tiny teeny little pieces um, but then they're really badly molded and so you end up with like these these horrible mold marks and unevenness that need to be that becomes unsightly on the sides of it like this okay it just looks bad but on the bottom, it actually becomes a problem because the parts don't fit. And I've been finding that to be true of virtually every piece that's part of this model. That they all require a good deal of manipulation to make them work. So, by popular request, meaning no one's really asked, but I'm just sort of imagining it because so far no one's really complained. <laughs> yeah, um, that's really a good way to do it, is to have a shop vac. I am basically just wearing really old pants, so as I file this down, As I'm filing this down, all the little plastic bits are just going on this pair of pants that are already filthy from having done gardening earlier this week. And... Oh, let's see. Yeah, what else? There's always something. Always something. The battery on my wall clock, the one with the big hands that I can see without my glasses, uh, that gave out, and uh, the second hand, it's really kind of sad, the second hand is just going, mm, 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 just kind of uh, pathetically trying to move, but it stuck at like 3.15, I'm guessing it was like 3.15 in the morning, and so I have to um, look carefully at the tiny little clock on the monitor in front of me. Nice. Um, yeah. I, I have to take my glasses off to see up close. That's kind of the opposite of a lot of older folks is uh, they become farsighted, which means they can't see close, but I'm so nearsighted that um, that I can see up close, but not far away. Okay, this part is still really not good. If you look at it here, you can see, see how it's rocking on there. The, the center part is much, is higher than the lower part. And even if I flip it around so that the bunks go in this direction, the same problem. So I need to continue just as I did on the other ones, working on these. I did check my donor submarine. I've got a, actually three of these kits, and I checked the uh, the Ethan Allen. That's the part, the submarine from which I borrowed these parts that are not not warped.
that would be yeah I could do that but then I oh that would make even that would be even messier the other thing about uh, getting on in age is you kind of do what you know and don't try new things and I'm, I'm finding that to be the case too is I know how to file things down but I don't have a I have a whetstone um, that I use for sharpening knives. I might try that on some other parts. A lot of these are so tiny, though, that uh, they can't be done. I showed these before. These, these things that look like dust particles in this bag are, in fact... There's one there. Tiny little chairs little bitty chairs oh that's a really nice thing yeah is uh, you know doing this still still results in some rocking back and forth but having something that's totally flat that one could just rub on like that that would be a good thing to have if I ever to do more of this and I'm not sure that I really want to after this this experiment. Um, I might get some of those. I might get something like that. When I decided to put this submarine together, um, it's basically recreating a submarine I did when I was a kid. Uh, I didn't expect that I would have to be reshaping all of the parts. don't remember when I was young having to do much more than maybe scrape some flashing now and then. But since these that I'm working with are originals from the 60s, they're not reproduction sets, they're original sets. It must have been like that. And when I was younger, just doing this kind of thing, Maybe it was that I just didn't care that much about the, this kind of detail. I'd scrape off the, the bad bits of the flashing and just go with that. Okay, well these, you can see how this is coming together. Yeah, I mean, you, a kitchen counter would actually give you that. You know, that would be a good source. Go back a little bit. There's a little bit of a gap on the bottom, but it's not too bad. So doing this stream, and I appreciate your your suggestions because those are things I should try, especially as um, I'm working on things that need to be flat. Okay. that um, need to be a, an even or a flat surface is I, I'm actually learning a fair amount about how to do things by doing a stream because I am not an expert at any of this. I've had not even any book learning. Um, basically, I built models when I was a kid and I built this one originally, if I recall correctly, when I was like in seventh grade. Yeah, you know, wow, that's that's really cool. Um, and a lot of people who are really expert modelers can do that kind of thing. They 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 have the tools and they know what they're doing, and so they're able to to modify models and in some ways um, you know you can even get accessory parts kits to to do that with some planes i've noticed that when i look online that like with model airplanes 
the, sometimes the model kits are not really historically accurate, or even with car kits, they're not historically accurate. And so you get aftermarket X, uh, kits to get more historically accurate parts. What you'll find by watching me do this, this stream, is that I am not an expert painter. I am not an expert model maker.
Ah, okay. Um, apparently, whatever it was got fixed. I'm not sure what, what happened. I got this little pop-up message saying that there was not enough disk space to continue recording, which probably means that the disk was full, right? That's what it means. Um, so it took a early break and back early because it's fixed and now I can go on. Oh, yeah. Um, so short break. Let's recap. Um, yesterday in prep for this, I fixed the torpedo racks in the torpedo room. And today I did some red touch up where the heads of the torpedoes needed a little more red paint. And I put another coat of the ivory paint on to where the restroom is going to be the head of the, not the head, that's called the head. Yeah, I got back from break early because I took a break because it stopped recording. And uh, the DM was down here, our technical wizard, who f fixed it but wanted to check to make sure that it was actually really fixed. What I might end up doing is taking a couple of short breaks today. We'll see, depending on how my back holds up here on this batch. Anyway, so this is ready now to be installed into the hull of the submarine, which will be really nice because it'll be something that's done. Um, and then I did some touch-up work on the conning tower or the sail. Uh, you can see that I used the dark gray paint here to represent the edge of the hull that is cut away. Okay, and I did that keeping a nice fairly even line around the top, but the gray paint slopped around the bottom and I had to do some touch up. And it's a little wavy, but it's not perfect, but it's adequate on the bottom. So this is done. And now what I'm working on is filing and sanding down the pieces for the bunk deck. This is the mess deck and bunk deck number three out of, uh, let's see how many steps there are. Nine. Does it end at nine? It couldn't be. These are the instructions. They just go on and on and on and on. Final assembly is number nine. Yeah, might get to that yet yeah, this lifetime. You never know. So, so far what I've done is one and two. Um, two, I'm not quite finished with one, but getting close. Now I'm working on the mess deck and bunk deck. The bunk deck is just this little bit here, but it's proving to be somewhat of a challenge. And I'm trying to get the parts filed and sanded down well enough so that they can be primed so that I can work out painting them. Um, the the manufacturing process here leaves a lot to be desired. So you can see on this staircase, there's, there's all this extra flashing and just bits of plastic that just make it not work. Um, so it's just this little bit here. There's this little bit here that I'm working on today. And when I'm done getting this ready, I'm going to uh, do some sanding on the back of the sail, the conning tower. And I'll show that to you when I get to it. And then I am going to begin working on some of these parts. Okay. What I'd like to do at a minimum is... Um, These are all supposed to go in a specific order. Stack. That's the mess deck as shown. Well, they want me to put the chairs in first. Okay. And then a bunch of tables. 25, 46. And all of these. 
Yeah, the coffee urn. There's actually a coffee urn that goes on to all, anyway, all of these parts need to be painted nicely and in detail. You got pots hanging down, you got meat hanging down, you got a uh, condiment. Uh, you can't see them here, but there's condiment containers on the sides of these things. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of an interesting challenge to get all of that done in any kind of detail. When I was a kid, if you look at the painting instructions, I mean, it's really nice, right? It's like paint the chairs green, paint the tops of the tables white, paint all the kitchen appliances white, paint the sheets white. It doesn't tell you what color to paint the tables or the floor or the little detail on any of the... Uh, countertops and kitchen appliances it's really not very helpful so i kind of look at the box top uh, to give some guide as to what colors other parts of this thing are supposed to be anyway um can't get any of it done if the plastic parts don't fit so i need to cut off cut off the flashing the extra flashing sand down the mold marks these little circle things actually show you can actually see them once the thing is put together um, if you look inside and so i really i like to sand that down as well so that the little circles don't show it's especially true because these actually hang out um, outside of the half hall. And so this, this is highly visible. Anyway, um, as I was saying earlier, this, this kit is very well de designed and very badly executed. So, most of today's stream is prepping parts so that they actually can be used and, inst and painted and installed into the submarine layer. So, I got the four bunks to the point where they're useful, usable. Now, I'm doing getting the bulkhead this this bulkhead has a fire extinguisher on it that's the only detail that will actually appear in the model the rest of this is just a wall anyway if i can get these done um to the point where they can be used then i can prime them between now and next week and begin painting so I want to get this room done, so I'm going to get these done first, and then I'm going to sand the conning tower down so that that's ready to go. It's not something that's essential to be doing right away, but I, I want to see how the plastic putty works. And then um, I'm going to install the torpedo room. And that will be a momentous occasion. I'm not kidding. It'll be, uh, it'll be quite a big deal for me at least getting, getting rid of these circles, getting that part into the submarine. And after those things are done, See the circle shows up here. You can see it as a bright spot because it's at a different level than the rest of it. And becomes something that is not a thing that would be in the submarine. I probably should be using like a sanding block, shouldn't I? So that I'm not gouging the surface or making it uneven, but 
I'm just taking a little bit off. And then I'm going to use some finer sandpaper to polish it so that it, um, so that the texture is smooth like the original plastic. There. No. Not entirely certain why all those things have to be on so many parts. Little circle things. They just they just show up everywhere, and they're very distracting. I think from the from the rest of the model. This is like um, 600 or something. I have some 1200 level. It, just to get rid of all of the, uh, the scratch marks. Let's smooth the surface back to where it had been before. If one that's so fine, I um, did a Phantom Mustang, if you're familiar with that kit. It's a uh, 132nd model P51D, and it is all, the exterior is all in clear plastic, which presents its challenges in terms of uh, prep work and things. But I dropped a bit of glue model cement on the wing which is not good, but I was able to use a really, really fine emery cloth, so fine that it, um, I was able to polish it out. I was actually able to polish it out so it looked clear again, which was kind of nice. Anyway, this is uh, one level coarser than that, but it's, uh, it's pretty effective at just getting rid of the scratch marks that came from using the coarser sandpaper. Okay, so there's this part, and where this part goes is, in terms of this, is it goes here. It's the little pegs on the bottom, and it, um, it's supposed to fit in there in a way that the fire, there we go, the fire extinguishers are between the bunks. So, yeah, there, doesn't work. Yeah, so that's supposed to be like between the bunks. So that if there's a fire, this, whoever's sleeping there can jump out and uh, put out the fire. The idea, anyway. Actually, it looks like it goes on this side. Yeah. No, it doesn't. The uh, the fire extinguishers apparently go into the gyro room. There's these little pegs on the bottom here that are supposed to help you align the uh, the bulkhead to the piece that you're working on. And on this side is the gyro room. And the gyro room is number five. Gyro deck has many fire extinguishers on it. Oh, well, I dropped something. The last time I dropped something, it fell under the workbench. That was pretty annoying.
I really think the fire extinguisher should be in this room. Although it doesn't really fit there. I'm a bit confused about, yeah, this, right? This one goes here. This one goes here because this side is just like a ballast tank, so it's flat. And this side goes here, like this. And the bunk deck does not have fire extinguishers. The gyro room just has a lot of them. Go figure. Okay. Um, put these back in so that I know where they go and that I got them done. And I'm going to look down on the floor. And luckily, this one didn't go flying under the workbench. This bulkhead goes here like that. And then this bulkhead um, goes there. And the side that shows, okay, this will show, has some of these really dumb little circle things on them. And then this, what I have no clue what that's supposed to be. It's just something is etched in there or stamped in there as part of the detail, but it just it doesn't look like anything. So it's probably going to go away when I sand off the, the circles. Okay. Um, that I'm looking for is this, the little flat file. This is a this is where it was attached to the tree, the, the plastic tree, and it's a big protuberance. So I mean, the, the file works pretty fast on it. And then I'll use some sandpaper to uh, even it out once it is down close to the surface underneath. There we go. Sand that. There's mold marks all the way around the outside of this. My wall clock stopped working. We get really close to the screen there and take a look at where we are in terms of time. Not too bad. So I finished this and then do the staircase, try to salvage this from itself. Okay. Um, that's the last piece. Seriously? <laughs> Gravity is doing me harm today. Yeah, so the subtitle of this show is More Cost Overruns because, um, not show, stream, whatever, show my age. I will use whatever words come to mind um, because everything on this submarine has taken two, sometimes three times longer than um, one would expect. And so just like any other piece of government work, What's happening here is that um, there's cost overruns. In terms of the amount of time it's taking me to get this done. So these, like I said, these little circles, which have nothing at all to do with the reality of the submarine, are built into the molding. And they are in a place where they'll be very visible once this thing's put together. So I'm going out of my way to sand them out.
making a lot of plastic dust in the process. So I'm using sort of coarse, slightly coarse sandpaper to do that. And then I use the fine stuff to polish it once it's done. So that this, this micro scratch marks from the sandpaper don't show. Well, I'm being fairly successful at getting rid of stuff here. But I think what I'm going to do is after I finish these parts, getting them prepped, and once they're prepped, then I can prime them, and then I can begin painting the bunk deck, uh, if I have submarine Wednesday next week, that's always subject to veto from, well, it depends on people, how people react to it. If you like to, if you want to keep watching submarine Wednesday, please let us know in chat or on social media or, you know, in some fashion. If you would prefer not to have any more submarine cost overruns on Monday, on Wednesdays, uh, let us know and I'll do something else. But in the meantime, I do have continued permission from our dungeon mistress, Alexis, to uh, continue using Wednesday precious streaming time to uh, try to build this submarine. And I don't know what this these things were meant to be. I have no idea if they're gone now, which is fine because they had no apparent meaning or purpose. We're trying to see them. I'm gonna give that a little more. Okay. Um, yeah, so then the last bit of the bunk deck, which in terms of parts is the simplest of this mess of things, is um, the staircase. And then we're going to have to wipe all of these down with some sort of damp cloth because there's a, before I prime them because it's all covered with little bits of plastic dust. So the staircase um, is supposed to go up here like that. And there's a little pin right here that's supposed to fit into that hole, but it's smothered by this piece of plastic there, which is a remnant of where it came off of the tree, the plastic tree. And what I need to do, I'm going to use a really a much smaller file, is I need to get rid of that without getting rid of the pin. The all I do here, at least I can see where the bottom step is. It goes that's not part of the bottom step. That's bad plastic. That needs to go away. And I'm going to very slowly and turn it in such a way so I'm not affecting the pin on the bottom. I'll away at it until it is gone. done with this, it should actually look like a staircase, and it should actually fit into that little hole, and um, I'll try to fit, see how it works. Two-thirds of it, the half of it gone. Anybody who is watching Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons, will realize quickly that I am not a master modeler, nor am I a master painter. I am um, 
bumbling through with the skills I acquired when I was much, much younger, which is to say, everything I learned about modeling is whatever I figured out on my own when I was like 11 and 12 years old. And I think I've gotten a little better since. I've learned about things like, oh, when you glue the two halves of a fuselage of a plane together and there's this gap between them, you can actually do something about that. So I have to say that when I was young and I was doing modeling, it was, uh, I'd bring home a model of like a B-25, say, a Mitchell bomber, just to make something up. So I'd bring home this model of the B-25 and it was molded in silver plastic, so you didn't have to paint it because when I first started doing things, I didn't have any paints. Didn't even know you, sh you could paint, so, which shows you how primitive I was. Um, so yeah, I would uh, put together the B-25 and use tube cement so it got all over everything and smudged the surface. And then there was always this gap, these gaps in the fuselage. And it wasn't until much later that I learned that one can actually do something about that um, to fill them in, make them go away. Yeah. Never, never learned how to be a master modeler. In fact, I didn't, hadn't built any models until pretty recently at all. Since I was uh, like a teen. And I read a book, got some books about modeling, and it was, oh, wow, look at all the things you can do with a model. You can do all these paint effects, you can fill in the gaps, you can use liquid cement instead of tube cement. And it was a real eye opener because I didn't know any of those things when I was growing up. My dad had made models, but it was in, in his day, they were mainly balsa wood. And the parts came with directions and pretty much had to hand carve all of them to make it look like what they were supposed to do. They were not well formed or shaped. So when he put plastic models together, it was pretty much the same thing. Didn't paint any of them. Uh, didn't know about filling in the cracks or the gaps or anything like that. Although they were better done than mine because, you know, lack of skill. But, uh, yeah, he never read any books either about painting or modeling. So I never developed those skills as a youngster. And then as an oldster, knowing what they were, didn't mean that I could do them. So, for example, I'm really not good with an airbrush, which is very limiting in terms of doing very good modeling. Anyway, that's kind of a little autobiography of uh, model making and explaining why this is not a how-to show because I'm not a master modeler nor a master painter, but I do dungeon tiles for a D&D &D campaign, and I do that pretty well and because we make large quantities of them, and I'm reliving my childhood by doing this 1960s vintage submarine. And then I get to do things like annoy people by talking about 1960s TV and TV shows, cartoons, massive unemployment caused by the demise of television antennas. That was a theme not too long ago. Yeah, I mean, really good modelers spend a lot of time modifying the parts on their models, sometimes fabricating new ones. 
I'm doing a little bit of the same here, not to fabricate new parts, but to just get the ones that came with the kit to work. Yeah, you should see some of the pieces that, that came with this kit. They were, I mean, really, really badly done. There's some of them that are going to be totally unusable. That's why I have a backup kit to actually to get parts from them in case they don't work. It's like a control panel. Um, you'll see it when I start working on the control room in a couple of million years after I'm done with the mess deck. Um, but the control panels have all of the detail, this marvelous detail of dials and buttons and things like that, radar screens. And the whole thing is like caved in on itself. It was vacuum formed and it's just caved in. It's like the middle of it melted and sagged almost, which might have been what happened. Or the mold or the plastic wasn't injected far enough into the mold and it just sort of stuck to the edges but not the center. So I'm hoping that the parts on the donor models are better. I don't know yet. I haven't looked for them yet um, because I haven't gotten that far. I did get all the pieces to the kitchen though, the mess hall and the galley. Okay, this is starting to look like a staircase now. And I'm going to test this little pin is supposed to go in this little hole. Take the bunks off. It's supposed to go in like this. And uh, somehow or other, when the cement sets, yeah. Yeah, it sort of fits. It needs to be, as usual, uh, on either side of the pin. It doesn't set into the floor quite like it should. There. Um, that is what's supposed to happen with it. Later. There's always that just, it's like the top of the pin is just a little too big. I guess not the top. Well, the top if it's down on, but the bottom if you're looking at it from this direction so that it doesn't set perfectly flat onto the surface underneath okay that's better so the question now is uh, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna just sand the bottom of the staircase because there's bits of it that are just kind of dangling out there's a one of those circle things on the staircase there, and it, it extends out far enough you can actually see it when you look at it from the side. See what I mean? Is it like that oval? Okay, so when I'm done with these parts, I'm going to, since I'm doing sanding at the moment, I'm going to sand it down the uh, outside of the conning tower or the sail. Basically, it is a test 
is the test of how well the uh, plastic putty that I use to fill in the gap actually works. I have to say that unlike several of the streams of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons Submarine Wednesday edition, things are actually getting done today uh, without too many mishaps. Okay. The, the biggest mishaps have been uh, dropping things on the floor, in one case, making it very difficult to find it. So this. This is now looking like a staircase. It didn't when I first started working it, but now it does. And if the pin goes in just right, it will set on the floor. That's going to be a pain to cement in. And this is one of these things. Hold it in a motionless way, applying moderate pressure for at least four minutes. And there's no way, I mean, you just have to hold it by hand, right? So the stair will go in before the bunks, and then the bunks are assembled around it. And these are the bulkheads that frame this. And oh, I don't know about the bottom here. You know, the this is another one of those things where the the whole bottom half of this extends out beyond the end of the submarine. And so all of this the numbers and circles and things show. So I think I'm just going to uh, sand that down to just doesn't hurt to get it. It just doesn't hurt it to, uh, have those things not show later. It all gets painted that dark gray color. So if these are sanded nice and nice and flat, okay, so that they're not there anymore. It should look okay once it's uh, once it's done. You know, it's like, why well, take the time to do this? But it'll show, and it's just annoying. I'm going to be taking two breaks today. Um, usually I stop about noon and I go to like 12... 15, uh, 12, 20, 12, 30 or something. I keep saying it's going to be a 20 minute break and it always turns into 30. And it's just something that happens, right? Um, but in this case, we had a little bit of a technical problem. So I had to do it, take a short break earlier. And I'm going to go until about maybe a little bit before one. After, I'm going to work on this, and then I'm going to sand the sail. And then after that, I'm going to take a break and then come back, and we're going to have, like, the the celebration of the installation of the torpedo room. That's the highlight. That's the highlight of the stream today. It will be the installation of the torpedo room into the hull of the submarine. Hmm. The circle's done. Now I've got this number in the middle. That came off pretty easily.
And then I'm going to get out this, this fine stuff again and at least, you know, get rid of the, get rid of most of the scratches from the, from the coarser sandpaper. After you put uh, some primer on and a layer of paint, uh, you know, little scratches won't show too much, but I don't want the texture to be screwed up too much. So after the stream, what I'll be doing is cleaning all of these. Probably, you know, maybe I'll use water and maybe a little denatured alcohol. I don't think the, the denatured alcohol will hurt the plastic any. But I'm going to clean these off because there's a lot of dust on them from the plastic sanding and filing. And then I'm going to prime them. And if we have submarine Wednesday next week, I'll be starting to paint them. And I'll explain a little bit more about what will be coming up. I might even uh, be able to get some of the mess hall part done. What I'd like to do is at least prime the bottom, the base of this. Okay. It doesn't require too terribly much work. It's just a little flashing around the edges. Um, so I'm going to prime this as well, because this has to be painted before anything else can be done, before the tables and chairs all get put in. Um, these are benches, and this is some sort of workstation. So most of this is going to be painted the floor color, whatever that is. It's a choice of two different colors. And then I'll be painting these benches for tables that go on them. Okay. Um, floor color will be one of two colors. The floor color that matches the box top is a, sort of a light, almost beige -ish kind of color. I'm not sure that that paint will level very well on a large surface like this, though. So I'm going to test it on the bottom, this, the bottom of this first and see how it looks. And if it works, then that's what I'll be using. If not, I'll be using what's called cork brown, which is the color of the um, some of the surface, some of the floors that I did before, like in the, in the conning tower and the walkway on the torpedo room. So there are the pieces for the bunk deck. I'm just going to do a little bit of work on this, which is the floor of the mess deck. There's also bunks. They have bunks everywhere on the submarine. I guess wherever there's, wherever you can squeeze them in. I'm guessing that uh, people will sleep near where they're stationed so that the bunks in the torpedo room are the people who work in the torpedo room. These bunks here, this set of bunks, which goes here, I'm guessing is filled with uh, the kitchen crew, right? I mean, it would make sense. And of course, it doesn't fit, so that'll require a little bit of work. Uh, that this is the mess hall, that these are probably the people who work there, so that you're right close to where you're working. Very, very short commutes on the submarine. Most of these are um, this little bit like this is a protuberance from where it was attached to the tree. The non-usable bits of plastic that uh, hold all the pieces together. Fortunately, when this was cut out uh, or broken off, Sometimes the whole, you get this gap where the tree was attached and it just breaks off a chunk of the plastic altogether. And that's a pain. Okay, this is cursed with all these little um, circles underneath as well. And this shows 
these here will definitely show if you looked or to look underneath when it's all put together. So I'm going to sand. Yeah, what time is it? Sorry, my wall clock is broken. So I have to do this. 12.30. Okay, I got about a half hour before one. So I'm going to sand these off. And these circles, these annoying circle things. And um, polish the bottom. And then I'll be done with this. And the other thing, the other piece that I'm going to prep uh, is that set of bunks that I showed you just a minute ago. Because when I'm painting these other bunks, it uses the same color set. Same color for the frames and the white for the sheets. So, um, yeah, I'll just do that. I'll just do them all together. Well, these are really bad. These are particularly particularly raised up and nasty, these circles. So this floor also has the disadvantage of all these holes. All these holes are where like the tables and chairs get glued in. Um, those will show as well. And so with this particular deck, what I really should do, not being a master modeler, but being a little persnickety, that's a good word, about the appearance is that after all those things are glued in, hopefully without breaking anything, is I'm going to turn this over and fill all those little holes in with plastic putty and sand them down and then paint the bottom. And the reason for that is that this deck actually extends out from the hull. About half of it is inside the hull and the other half is out. And if you look underneath it, you can see all of that. And it just looks, it just looks bad. So that's going to be, you know, a lot of, uh, all those pieces need to be painted before they're glued in, before they're cemented in. So that's going to be a ways down the road, but, um, you know, I won't be pushing down on it quite as hard. I'll be holding it gently with all these holes filled in with plastic putty and just sanding them down so that um, they don't show. And at least that's the intent. Yeah, the bottom of this part, and I think it's the same thing will be true of the control room, is just particularly bad in terms of um, the weird things that are molded onto it that make it look bad. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so when I was like 11, when I did this the first time, I didn't care about this. I'm not sure I even painted the bottoms of these things. I remember when I was done with it, that it looked pretty good, I thought. But thinking back at how I built it, you know, in terms of not attending to a lot of the detail and using paints that weren't very good and a brush that wasn't, that wasn't very fine, and had like two brushes, neither of which were in like three times as the size of the, the detail brush I've got now. Um, yeah, it must have looked pretty terrible. So far, so far, this is looking okay. I have to say that the parts that I've finished so far. Um, look all right. And you'll see those after you can see my filthy gardening pants and all the little pieces of plastic dust that are coming off of the sanding here. 
Yeah, I think this is this is certainly looking better than the model I did when I was a kid. Uh, it's also taking like ten times as long because I start paying attention to whether parts fit and whether the holes where parts fit are filled in or not, and you know, just stuff I never even noticed when I was younger. Say, why am I doing this? Why am I taking all the time to get rid of these circles? Well, it's because they actually will show um, when this thing is put together, and they weren't there on the submarine. So even though my detail painting isn't terrific, it, uh, it at least at least says these things shouldn't be here. And let's sand them down, get rid of them so they don't show, polish the plastics so that the texture doesn't look too rough when it's painted. And then, um, and then we can prime it and paint it and move on to tiny little chairs. Okay, so I'm going to finish sanding this down. I'm going to clean up the bunk. There isn't too much to do on this. This is actually in pretty good condition, these bunks. And then that will be, if that's all I get done today, there will be plenty then for me to prime um, so that I could begin basically painting bunk beds of course the next time i do submarine work i'm thinking you know these circles are probably the most annoying part of everything we've said that before and i will continue to say it they are really annoying because they just don't need to be there i can understand the injection molding, you know, the mold didn't get together very well. And so a bunch of flashing formed where the plastic leaked out between the two halves of the mold. You know, I can understand that kind of thing. It's just, you know, you're producing this as fast as you can and quality control, you know, isn't the greatest. Either a kid is going to do it and they don't care or somebody old is going to do it when they're going to do what I'm doing. Because, you know, what else is there to do when you're older than sand down, surf, sand down parts on a model? Um, but these circles, I don't understand. I really don't understand why they're there. They don't have, given the amount of detail in the mold, it's like somebody went out of their way to put them there. They didn't just spontaneously happen. They're not just a, a flaw of some sort. but they show up in places where they're highly visible and they just ruin the, the, the surface appearance of the part. And so I just feel much better about it when they're gone. So this really nice fine emery cloth doesn't get rid of all the scratch marks, but it, it gets rid of most of them so that the surface, you know, after it's primed and painted, doesn't look all scabbed up. The scratches that are left are very, very tiny. But you can see there's a lot of dust that accumulates on it, and that all has to be washed out. What I probably should do 
and maybe I will in the future, is use a little finer grade of sandpaper to sand these out so it doesn't leave quite as many scratch marks. But I didn't. Um, yeah, so when I'm done with this bit, I'm going to do that bunk. And when I'm done with the bunk, I'm going to work on the sail. Just a little bit of sanding there to see how the plastic putty work in terms of filling in the, um, the gap that was left when the parts that didn't quite fit together were cemented. And then I'm going to take a short break. I will need a short break at that point. And then I'm going to come back and I keep promising this and I'm just a little bit anxious about it because nothing else has really worked. But I'm going to install the torpedo room into the hull. I do prom I'm promising myself that I will in fact do that after the break. Ooh, just a little bit of recalcitrant remnant of the circle here. Okay. We we'll just spend too much time doing this. So I'll leave that and then just. Uh, I just need to clear off. It's just flashing all around the outside of this because that's where the mold came together. And it just needs to come off. It isn't very much. It's like a hundredth of an inch or something, but it's, it's there. And it... Um, it will show. And if I recall, when I tested this a little bit ago, the part, it didn't fit. If I recall correctly, it, uh, it didn't fit into the slots on the floor. Need to a little bit of um, filing or sanding on that. Here's another one of those little circles. Lovely. I'm just going to file this one out. Because, of course, it's right on the front. When, they, when you look at it, there it is. The ones that are raised, like the ones that were just on the floor, those are pretty easy to get. These are inset. Some of them are down rather than up. So you need to take off all the plastic around it. But every edge has flashing material attached to it. <laughs> you know, the back is nice and smooth. Huh? I can't see it all. So this um, goes in here. We're supposed to go in here like this, that tab fits, this tab 
doesn't fit. So this tab needs to be made smaller. Back here, I need to get rid of that because that'll keep it from laying flat on the floor. Okay, this, it's always important to test fit of the parts with these older models because they don't fit. Still not going in. I think it's too big in every dimension. Okay. Yep. And that's what I was afraid of. There's little circles on I thought this would be I thought this was going too easily. face of the bunk has all sorts of little circles on it, right? Of course it does. I need to, I'm just going to file that and then polish it. Again. Okay. There. Now it fits, but it, you can barely see them. But all over there, there's this, these circles. And so the whole face of this basically needs to be filed down. Now you can begin to see them a little better um, as shiny spots because they're inset. I wish I could say that that was a feature, not a bug, but it's definitely a bug. It's coming along so well until I notice those. Yeah, I mean, it's not taking a lot of time, but it's more, it's tight taking time. I would rather be spent not getting rid of little circles on bunks. There's no reason to have little circles at all. They're pretty deep little circles. They're being really annoying. Would have been better off if I'd known that at the start. I was just putting a little dab of the plastic putty on them and, um, and sanding them down.
But I didn't, and so I didn't. Okay, well, just a little expression of frustration there at the presence of unnecessarily and annoying little circles. And this makes cleaning this up all the harder. And to get rid of all the plastic dust and the little bits of overhang and things that don't need to be there. Um, yeah. I'll be spending a good deal of time cleaning off the plastic dust on these things before I end up finally priming them. you can see there's it's dirty okay so what I've got here is um, all the parts to the bunk room the four bunks the stairs the two bulkheads ready to prime I've got the floor and the bunk ready to prime for the mess hall um, at least once I get all the dust off of them and what I'll be doing then next time I do submarines is I'll be painting bunk beds, be painting the, the frames brown and the sheets white. And I did this one uh, purposely because this is also a bunk and I'll be using the same color combination and the same more or less effective technique. Um, you can see here, one, there it is one example of what the bunks end up looking like. Thanks, a new follower. I really appreciate it. Um, I can even put my glasses on so I can read the chat screen. Hi, Berksley. Uh, welcome uh, to Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons. And you've been listening to me muttering to myself as I am trying to get these very badly molded parts from a 1960s vintage Renoir submarine to fit together and to not have flashing and uh, mold marks and all sorts of other stuff showing. What I'm going to be doing next is... Okay, i got a couple minutes... is this is the hull of the submarine and parts of it have actually been installed as the conning tower or sometimes known as the sail and when the top of it was put in uh, very poorly fit there is a nice gap across the top so i'm going to take some sandpaper and i put plastic putty in there is yes, i'm going to take it gently Sand away at it. I'm doing this gently because I don't want to break it off. And the, uh, the effort here is to form a smooth and seamless, and continuous and smooth uh, surface between the two parts. And part of it is getting a putty, and part of it is actually sanding the plastic where the parts don't quite really fit together. A lot of this is just by feel. You know, it's a feel it's a, if the joint is smooth. The plastic putty seems to be you know, it's set long enough that uh, it seems to have a good solid consistency. 
the real proof in the pudding is when it's painted. Whether this nice, seamless and smooth joint makes it look like this is just one continuous piece of uh, submarine hull. I think instead of going stretch, it should be screech. <laughs> it was relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons submarine episode, whatever continues to be a challenge. This is this is okay. I haven't broken anything off yet, so that's a good good start. It made a lot of dirt and dust. You know, and so if the bite line of the um, plastic putty shows really nice clean edges like that, that means it's in the gap and not anywhere else, and that's good. So this is this is okay so far. There's a little overhang here where the top part actually extends kind of beyond the bottom part. And that whole thing needs to be modified so that they fit together. That's, that's you like, okay. I'll flip it around and do the front of it. And when I'm done with this, which will be, I don't know, like somewhere between two and ten minutes. Uh, when I'm done with this, I'm going to take a quick break, probably something like 15 minutes. Um, I had to take an early break early in the stream because it was a technical difficulty. And so usually I broke around noon, but I broke around 1130. Anyway, I, I will need to take a quick break and I'll be back and we're going to do the, the whole climax of the stream today, which is the installation of the torpedo room. This the torpedo room into the hull. Uh, okay. Hopefully it will fit. And the cement won't mush all over the place. And it will stay in place. And, yeah. But that's going to be quite an accomplishment, is finally getting that thing into the hull because it's been spending a lot of time um, not going where it's supposed to go. So you can see now that this is sanded down, that the gap is really quite small, okay? But until it was filled in, it was also pretty obvious. And this will need, before it's final painting, um, it's going to need some additional sanding so that the it's smooth across, okay? The, um, the top of the sail kind of extends a little bit over the side, and it needs to be the same. So it's going to need some sanding, like, along here, quite a bit of it, actually so that it matches up just right. When it's painted, it would show. But 
if it's um, if it's sanded down and nicely polished, it should be okay. And what I just learned is I need to be really careful how I hold it because I nearly broke one of the periscopes by getting my finger around the back, flipping it. Um, so there, that's what it looks like on the inside. So I just did some of that on the outside, and that, that will be okay. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, and what I will be doing when I get back is this. It looks like a simple task, but you never know, is going to be installed into the hull. And this submarine will then have a torpedo room. And then if that works okay, I can make that get in there and set nicely. I might even install this escape hatch. The uh, problem I noted when I did a test fit earlier in the day is that the radius of the hull is shorter than the radius of the bulkhead. And so it doesn't really want to go in. Oh, what the heck. It's not lined up. There we go. It doesn't really... There, that's what happens. It just goes like that. And in fact, it's in there firm enough. It's not, it's not aligned. It's a little... There we go. I'm not even going to cement it in. That is... It's done. The torpedo room... The torpedo room look has been has been installed into the hull of the submarine, and it uh, it's holding pretty firm. I'm not going to need to cement it. Okay, so what um, what I am going to do is I'm going to scrape a little bit of this paint off here. This is going to be painted that dark gray color. Okay this dark gray color sometime in the future. Not right now, because the consistency of the paint, as we discovered here, makes it run. And I don't want it to run on either side of this hull. Um, and you can see here where the three different decks are going. This is a ballast tank. This is the forward part of the mess hall. This thing right here goes there like that. Okay. And all the tables and chairs and everything are there. Um, and then the control deck goes here on the top of the, between the blue and the, and the ivory. And then that's the restroom. And then the, there's a bunk room, probably for the officers. And then the whole control room here, which is all filled with all sorts of control panels with dials and buttons and things. Um, yeah, I didn't expect it to go that easily. And it looks like it's it's lined up with a little notch. It's staying in. And what needs to be done then is this escape hatch. This little thing here somehow needs to be attached like that. Okay. And I didn't paint the tops of the escape hatch because the tops of the escape hatch are going to be painted the hull color, the color of the hull. And it's weird. They, um, yeah, they don't fit in very well when you look at it from the top. This is going to take some manipulation. There we go. There, that, that would fit just like that. So I'm probably going to I don't know. It's like the sail isn't cemented in, and this isn't cemented in. This, unless you really pull on it, unless you give it a yank, um, is in there pretty pretty firmly. I'm just going to leave it. Why would anybody give it a yank, right? That wouldn't make sense. But it's not. It's not fault. None of this is coming out with the gentle tug. There. Look at that, the forward torpedo room, including the escape hatch. As I know, isn't that weird? Who just, um, 
like this went in and it's stuck and I don't have to cement it, which is really good. This went in once I readjusted it and it fits, you know, pretty well. I need to paint the tops of those, but the whole hull will be painted at some point. Um, these guys all work. Okay, they're supposed to go up and down in their little tubes. And they, they inset into a little spot on the top of the hull. And they do. It insets really well. So well that um, it's stuck in there. There. These guys are all freely moving. Yep. I fixed that. These. I don't know what to say. I'm a, it's actually a little bit frightening to think that something actually went okay today. Hmm. Odd. Weird. So this thing here, this highly detailed forward bulkhead, eventually will go here. I'm not going to put it in. I tested it before. And what happens is it actually fits really quite tightly, kind of like this. It doesn't need to be cemented. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But to let you know that that will be worked on later, this whole thing will be painted. The parts that aren't painted will be painted green. But I still have work to do on some of the dials, the uh, like the clock and the and the little control dials. Um, but I'm going to celebrate the installation of the torpedo room into the hull by taking um, like a 15 minute break. Sometimes you need a break. I'll be back in a little while. And thank you again for the follow. Really appreciate it. Be right back. Well, welcome back from my break. Um, I hope you stayed with me. It wasn't a very long break, but... Um, is needed to stop for a bit. I'm going to move this this way so I can show you better what the next steps are going to be. Um, first of all, before doing that, we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate the installation of the torpedo room into the hull of the submarine. This is, uh, you know, if you've been watching the stream, you have been watching this not be installed uh, through all sorts of uh, tribulations. Just about everything that could go wrong went wrong. Some things that were could not possibly have gone wrong went wrong. That's why this <coughs> uh, this particular stream is entitled "More Cost Overruns" because that's that's the real life equivalent to what was been going on, which is that um, yeah, when things take like three times longer than you expected them to take and pieces don't fit and need to be reworked and the cement gives way and it has to be redone. Sorry, there's just dust, sanding dust all over the inside of this. Um, yeah, that's the, the equivalent of a cost overrun. And uh, yeah, this is this, these parts of the submarine in <laughs> real life terms probably are running <laughs> two to two and a half times uh, the originally intended cost. So, but they're done. Um, what I'm working on now is the bunk deck, which is all of these bits here. These are bunks that go on this deck. And I spent a good deal of time trying to get the parts to fit and work. And they're still flashing on that that I haven't gotten off. This is the mess deck, which also has bunks. And I spent a good deal of time getting this cleaned up. This I'm going to put out of the way, hopefully in a safe place, way over there, covered in a paper towel so that it doesn't get all dirty and dusty. 
Da 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 da. There's paper. Oh. There. Um, yeah. So I'm working on this stuff here and here. And this is the galley. So there's a lot of kitchen bits. Okay. Ranges and storage cabinets and a coffee urn, a little serving table and stuff, hanging meat. There is actually a part like that, hanging meat. These here are these, these bits here that make up the galley. And those need to be pretty much just painted white, okay? But then they need a lot of detail, like the the edges of the storage cabinets, okay? And the meat and the... You can see them there. There's a pus. Those are pans that are hanging there. Um, the faucet for the sink. Handles for the cabinets. Um, this one has little condiment containers all along the edges. So what I was thinking is I could do one of two things during the last half hour of the stream. During break. I fixed the clock that was important. The battery on my clock, wall clock had run out, so I couldn't tell where we were in terms of time. Um, so I can do a couple of things. One is continue to fix, this is so annoying, um, the flashing on the sides on the staircase. It's on the back of the staircase where it doesn't really show, but it's just, it's a, it's a significant amount of excess plastic that shouldn't be there. Yeah, this is a staircase, as you can see, sort of, that goes up from the bunk deck up the stairs to the, basically, the, the galley. I guess that's convenient. You just walk up for your meals, go down, get up, eat something, uh, go back down to your bunk and sleep it off. So um, I can do a cup. One of a couple of things here is I could continue to work on the dials of the forward torpedo bulkhead. Um, or what I'm thinking of doing is prepping these parts of the kitchen, of the galley, that are going to be painted white um, so that I can paint them. And what I'd really like is, really like is some gloss white spray paint, but I don't have that. Brushing it on, it's just not going to cover in one coat. Okay, so anyway, if I prep these parts, I'll have some options, which might include even pulling out the airbrush and trying to airbrush them. I'm not sure. But I can't do anything as long as they're a mess, and they are. They've got little bits of the trees from which they were not cut off. There's flashing all around the edges from the basically mold marks. But they're not going to fit. I can tell right off that they're not going to fit nicely into little holes where they're supposed to back here because the, there's too much excess plastic on the tabs. So what I probably will do, since it has to be done anyway, is I'm going to clean up these parts and then try to make some decision. I'm going to I'm going to be priming all these these bunk parts, okay, between now and the next submarine stream, whenever that might be, and that'll take a while to do some to get painted anyway, and if there's any time past painting. There's a lot of other parts, including these itsy bitsy little chairs that need to be cleaned up and primed. 
but I'm going to try to decide what to do in terms of getting these things painted white. They're really small and light. Um, with my, ex my experience with priming these with a spray can, even larger parts than these is that just the force of the spray makes them go flying. So these probably would like need to be taped down with double sided tape and then, and then painted. But it would be nice if I could um, get a nice even coat of paint on them. And that would involve either the airbrush, with which I am not skilled at all. Just absolutely no skill with that at all. I might have to recruit uh, Nicole to do that, you know, to um, pin down some nice white paint. We have we have some good nice white paint, and um, airbrush this on so that it's kind of evenly evenly coated without brush marks. But these parts need a lot of prep. There's I don't know if you can see it all, but there's just excess plastic all around the entire perimeter. Um, the back of the, this was flat part of the mold and then the, the detail on the front. And when it was molded, there was a gap between the molds and there's this, this thin layer of plastic all around the edges that show. And the other thing is that as with many other parts, like here, right? For no particular reason, there is this circle. That's not a clock or a dial or anything. It's just a molding flaw. And I'm going to carefully file that out because especially if there's a, any kind of gloss to the paint at all, that is really going to show very badly. So this is the kind of stuff that needs to be done to make these parts usable. presentable on this model, especially the kitchen, because the kitchen has a lot of really cool detail that will be um, a challenge to paint. You know, like I'll show you in just a minute, as soon as I get rid of this uh, annoying circular mold mark. Most of this, you know, it's a kitchen, it's going to be gloss, it's going to be nice and white, right? Everything will be white. They didn't, didn't have, I don't think this is a stainless steel kitchen. The painting instructions, such as they are, okay, give you this helpful thing, white, with arrows going to two of them. Well, why these two? Why not that one? What about this? What about this or that? Should those be white? Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty worthless, actually. Let's see. You know, the walls are painted a light, nice light blue pastel -y kind of color. Um, Typical, get all this dust in here. The edges aren't clear, but they're. I got rid of the annoying. I really hate these circular circular mold marks. There's a couple more that I'm gonna try to get rid of in a couple other places, and then there are some that I just can't do anything about because of where they are. I'll show you those in a second, and you can be annoyed along with me. There's that, but then you get this, like these storage compartments, right? And then right here, right there, is a circle right in the middle of one of them. And there's nothing I can do about that. I mean, there's no way I can fix that. This one was obvious. It was way up right at the top of the shelf. 
Um, I was able to get that out without affecting anything else. But when they're in the middle of the, the uh, storage cabinets, what can you do? So I think like with these, there's this, these little cabinets that painted white. And there's another one of those circles down there. Right. Um, I might just do like um, either a light gray to highlight the edges of the shelves. <laughs> or maybe um, maybe ivory so that it doesn't contrast too much. Let's see if this fits now. Yeah, I mean, sort of. It still doesn't go all the way in. So this is the kind of fiddly stuff that goes on with this model, is that um, just don't fit. They're covered with mold marks. They're covered with little circles. Um, they don't go into where they're supposed to go in. So it that's why it's uh, why there's so many cost overruns. Okay, now it goes there. So there's one part. I'm just going to leave it there so you can see where it goes, and see how this how the galley sort of comes together. Okay. Um, there's a bulkhead that goes here like this, and there's, uh, some, some hams, I guess, or who knows what pieces of meat hanging there. So this bulkhead goes here like this. I'll just put it there temporarily. I haven't cleaned it up, but that's where that goes. This, the, the galley gets really crowded. This goes when well, there's doors in front of it. So I'm going to paint all this detail, okay? This is really annoying. So I'm going to paint all this detail in, right? And what does the model do? The model hides it behind these doors like this. Um, it goes here like this, sort of. So in order to see all of that stuff, including the hanging meat off to the side, you have to poke your head and then look around somehow. Okay. Um, this goes in here like this. So apparently what's happening here if if we look at it this way is that um this is like the pantry okay and there's doors there's a door here and a door there and one door goes into the cold storage where the meat is hanging and the other door goes in here into all of these shelves where stuff that sits on shelves is sitting like cans i guess shelves or, or storage compartments. I'm guessing it should all be painted white too. It doesn't say so, but you know, it would make sense that this, you know, the cold and, and temperate storage would be also white. And, you know, as I've said with all of the parts, they, there's just this flashing on all of them um, from the mold that sticks out. It doesn't look good. Catch It will catch, it will catch the paint badly when it's painted. So it needs to be taken off. And then there's these marks from the, these, protuberances from the trees from which it was cut.
Okay, I'm beginning to see how this all fits together now. Because I didn't, I didn't remember from when I built this the very first time back in 1964 or 65, somewhere in that range. Probably around 64, give or take a year. And it's not obvious at all from the uh, instructions how it all fits together and how it's supposed to look. But it becomes clear when you actually put the pieces together. So there's, there's the cold storage on this side with the hanging meat and the temperate storage on this side with the shelves. Those two supposedly, it not only goes in these little holes in the bottom, but fits into, it's supposed to, but it doesn't. Okay, of course not. There's this uh, little gap here. This is supposed to fit right in there and then slide down into these holes. And for some reason, what is it? It's, um, if this is here and this slides into the little gap, the, um, it is not lined up with the, uh, with the tabs on the bottom. I mean, it just, it won't fit. It is at least a 32nd of an inch too far looking at it from the top here is this is set in first and it's firmly planted and this goes into the little gap um yeah it's too far over to the left and so the, the little tabs won't fit so i need to they're just positioning more than holding okay they need to be file down on that side pretty significantly. This is why it's really important before going ahead and painting, and especially before cementing, to make sure that the parts fit, because in this case, they usually don't. I've had probably the only thing that's really fit is when I put the torpedoes onto the torpedo racks and they just needed to set on so it would be really hard for them to not fit it would have been a real effort to have mismolded them so that they didn't fit but so far i would say that has been practically the only thing that has um, actually fit so again this is supposed to go in there See, it's part of that wall. And then it's supposed, these tabs are supposed to fit into these holes in the floor. And they're, they're closer. And so you can see what's supposed to happen, but it's still too far this way because it's pushing this wall aside. And I don't want to, I don't want to make that, I mean, I could, that kind of fits in like that. Because I could minimize this wall a little bit. Because it goes inside of that gap and it doesn't show. So this is the kind of fiddly stuff that ends up taking endless minutes, I mean, endless, endless minutes, forcing me to do things like talk about 1970s television shows or TVs themselves or employment installing TV antennas and what it was like when UHF was introduced and you needed to modify or, or replace your antenna, whether it's in the house or on the roof. Um, yeah, this is, you have to blame Renwall for this because Renwall is the thing that instead of moving along real quickly, requires me to modify virtually every piece 
so that it will fit. Yeah, and there's uh, four more little pieces that somehow need to go together here. All right, so that's that's how it's supposed to look, okay? <clears throat> it doesn't look like much after all of that, but this, this is a, a double storage room. And after you, all of the detail is done with great precision, and wailing and gnashing of teeth, they uh, they hide behind a door, and they're way behind all of everything else. So when you're looking at it, you're just going to be looking through this door, okay? You can see, you can't because I mean it just virtually disappears. So behind the tables, you'll be looking through these doors, which also don't fit, right? into those two storage rooms. Yay. Um, I'm going to leave that there for a second because what happens next is that this there, I got them backward. This part, which is really a mess, fits right in here, like that. The back of it is part of the storeroom. The front of it, you can see you can see what this is going to be like putting this together, right? Is uh, there's so much excess plastic here, but this counter fits into this supposedly into that little gap there, fits very tightly, and forms the side of the kitchen. I like this, and then this piece is the back of the kitchen, like that. These pieces fit together, and then this, the galley, sorry, the galley, fits there like this. Yeah, and that's a very nice, tight little thing there, and of course this table is in the way so that um, you can't get to all the cabinets and counters. And then on the top of this, in order to hide all the detail, that one has just spent a ton of time uh, painting. That goes there, and then a coffee urn goes here. Okay. But as you can see, none of these parts fit. And they, this one in particular is really a mess in terms of this is what I mean by the flashing. You can see it all around the edge. This is the excess plastic from the um, from the molding process. <clears throat> Doing there's enough time to like maybe clean up one more of these. And I'm working on these because they're eventually going to be painted white, and then after they're painted nice and white. I will attempt to do things like paint the uh, pans and the kitchen faucet and the uh, cupboard doors. Of course, it's got a circle right there on this cabinet. Is that an inside circle, an, an inset circle? Probably. I'm not sure anything can be done about that. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so you can begin to see how this goes together and how after, and why when you're like 11 years old, you go, I'm just going to paint it white because then you peek through this door and you can barely see it anyway. Why go through the trouble of painting all the detail? Why, you might ask? Because it's there. Yeah, there's so much on here that instead of just filing or sanding it, I'm going to make the first pass with this X-Acto knife uh, to try to cut away is cut away a bunch of it. Not right down to the surface. I don't want to cut into the actual surface of the model, but I do want to 
get rid of some of this, at least a portion of it, before I start uh, using a finer tool. When I was younger, I would have just used a single edge razor blade to do this because that's the tool I had. And then I would have just scraped all of this off and I would have slapped it white paint on it and I would have stuck it in and it wouldn't have fit. So I just would have put more cement on it and the cement would have melted the plastic um, in the hole and in the tabs. And eventually it would have slid in, making a big puddle of tube cement around it that um, I wouldn't care about because, you know, that's how it was. So there, this is what I mean about the, the amount of detail, you know, like the pots and pans hanging there. You can see them at the same time, the detail and the design at the same time, the execution, the actual production of it was terrible just terrible production quality. And I can say that because this kit was made in like 1962 or three or something. And uh, I'm sure whoever was involved in it isn't working at Renwall anymore. I'm sure that quality control has changed since then. But To say that, uh, yeah, just like some some of the early balsa wood models, not the early ones, you know, you know the ones that were made in the 20s and 30s, where you'd get pretty much a block of wood with some lines drawn on it and a picture to follow. And what you were supposed to do is get your carving tools out and your sanding tools and shape this block of balsa wood to make it look like what the model is supposed to look like. This isn't quite as crude as that, but let's just say that uh, the modeler, in this case me, not even being a master modeler, but just somebody who wants to recreate um, a, an experience from grade school, yeah, gets to do almost the same sort of thing with the plastic model. You get a lump of plastic that's more or less in the shape of the thing that you want in the picture, and then you worry at it with various and sundry shaping tools until it fits to where it's supposed to go and looks sort of like the picture makes it look. And I'm not, I don't want to file too much on here, but it, it needs to um, it needs to fit into the corner of the door at some point. So I'll have to fit that piece in before I can fit this piece in. I'm not going to finish prepping the stuff that's going to be painted white today. Uh, clearly, I've got like five minutes left, so I'm just going to finish this one, however long it takes. And there's uh, a bunch more. I got two done in the span of forever. I guess that's something. But this is slow and meticulous, and for, it is, for me, kind of relaxing, actually. Uh, if for you, relaxing is being kind of bored or maybe enjoying listening to what uh, home, you know, home visits by TV repair people used to be like. Working. Um, I will be back on Friday about 10. Give or take a couple of minutes, usually take a couple of minutes. I tend to start the stream just a couple of minutes after the hour just to heighten the anticipation or because I was late or because whatever. So right around 10 on Friday from 10 until 2, relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons will resume. 
and I'm not sure what I'll be doing on Friday. Um, the sewer tiles are pretty much painted. So unless I was to do some additional detailing, and I might do that, just adding to the slimy look of some of the floor tiles, that might be one thing to do. I don't have any mini figs left. I finished those on Monday. Um, so it's going to be, I don't know what's going to happen on Relaxing Painting on Friday. So join us in the stream and be prepared for a uh, surprise. I guess it won't be surprising, but it will be um, unknown. Let's see how this piece fits. It's supposed to go here. This is supposed to go like this, and then, yeah, right. It should just slide right into those those little slots on the floor, which are supposed to match these pegs. Can't really see what is or isn't lining up. Can you imagine doing this after it's painted and you got cement dangling on the ends of this, um, trying to fit together? Yeah, that would not be good. I can imagine doing that. That's probably what I did. Some of the other slots are just not aligned. It's hard to tell from the lack of angle that I can get. Okay, I'm going to take this out. I hate to do that because I got it to fit. Let's see if I can't get this piece in. Everything is real tight fit. So after. After getting all of these prepped, I'm going to re-prep all of them because I'm not going to be able to trust the fit uh, before priming them. Okay. The, um, they seem to line up with the holes, but they are... One of the others didn't line up at all, but these seem to be, like, too thick from front to back, they don't insert. So I'm going to file away from the back because I don't want to get scars all over the front of this. Yeah, the prep work on this is just amazing. The amount of work that needs to be done to get these pieces to even fit. If I get this to fit, then I have to refit everything else, too, to make sure that all of those things fit. Okay, so this, that end is going in, but the little one, the little one isn't anywhere near the right size yet. <laughs> yep, so I'm going to go a little bit long because I... Well, maybe not. Maybe I'll just stop at some point and say, okay, it's just not working. At this point, I need to uh, save this for another time. So I'm going to just do a little bit more filing and see if I'm getting close. And then I'm going to um, recap quickly and wrap up okay so now you can see where that goes that fits supposedly that fits there and supposedly this will continue to fit here behind it
which it did sort of before, but now it's not. Yeah, that needs to go in. That needs to be there. It, it will go in, but not, but somewhat reluctantly. And then this part is supposed to go into that slot and into the floor at the same time, like that. Okay. So that's how that kind of goes together, at least for now. Um, why is there such a big gap there? I'm not sure. It's like it's leaning back when I it shouldn't be leaning back. I have to work on that. I guess it's supposed to look like that. Okay, but I would think that these would like make contact instead of having that gap all around it. I don't know what that's all about. Looks like it's in too far. But that's what goes here. Okay. And those are the tabs that it, that it fits into. So regardless of like why are there all these shells that are hidden behind whatever this is, Unless it's supposed to look like you walk in behind there. I don't know. I'm not quite understanding the intent of the uh, of this particular set of pieces. But that's how they fit. I mean, for, for better or worse, that is how it goes. Um, so we'll continue to work on these in an effort to figure out some meaning to them. But I'm going to stop now and put these pieces away, do a recap. First, thank you. Thank you for uh, watching. Those of you who have become followers, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, please consider being a follower. Have your friends and relatives become followers, become subscribers. Watch us on YouTube, and if you really like Relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons, even if it's uh, not relaxing submarine day. Uh, feel, consider going to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons slash dice and dungeons and becoming a patron. And also, uh, we invite you to watch our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, which streams on Twitch and then shows up later on YouTube and as a podcast. That is three Sundays a month, uh, starting at two. Here, let me show off our accomplishment. This is my accomplishment today, which was cleaning up this sail and installing the torpedo room, including the escape hatch, sanding down and cleaning up. And it's not too bad the gaps on the back of the sail here. So when that's all painted, the hull color, which is that dark gray, it should look pretty good on the outside. That'll be right near the end of everything, of course. Now I continue to work on the bunks, the bunk deck here, and the galley deck here, okay? And uh, very, very slowly and painfully getting these pieces to somehow fit. I want to take these and put them back in this container because I'm not going to be able to find them. They're not ready for that yet. They're not ready for prime time. But I will be priming all of these in the bunk deck. I'll be priming the floor to the galley and the bunks that fit into the bunk deck behind the galley. Kind of like a, I don't know, part of the mess hall and the galley. Um, so that I can begin to complain about the fit and finish, but also paint bunks. And painting bunks is a little bit of a chore because the backs need to be painted brown, so brown goes everywhere, and then 
attempting to paint the sheets white, uh, multiple coats of white, um, and then touching up with brown, and then touching up with white until it all globs up. And yeah, anyway, that's what's going to happen over the next at the next submarine. Wednesday, what I'm looking for is the really, really fine emery cloth because I want to this little tab thing that hangs out. Why am I? I want to do that before it's prime. I think this is like another doorway or something. I'm not sure. I don't know why they would even let an 11 year old kid try to do this. I guess because it, you know, it turned out looking like it was made by an 11 year old kid. Anyway, yes, Dungeons and Dragons Sundays at 2. <clears throat> Relaxing painting with dice and dungeons Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 until 2. <laughs> I will be back Friday morning with something. I don't know what. I uh, will be finding out between now and then, and you will see what it is on Friday. Thanks again. Thanks for following. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for being a patron. Um, yeah, see you all Friday.